Hello and welcome to this Fane online event. It's a very, very special one. My name's Elizabeth Day. I'm an author and podcaster, and it is my utter delight and privilege to be sitting opposite the one and only Nigel Slater. Hello, Nigel. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for having me in your Instagram famous home. <laughs> it's so beautiful. But before you start talking, I've got an introduction. Oh, please. I've got an introduction that I've written to you. Uh, you describe yourself ever so modestly as a cook who writes, but Nigel Slater is also a man who has brought solace to so many of us with his delicious food and his kind, reassuring way of writing about it. Extracts from his books are famously read at weddings, supposedly to express the couple's love for each other, but I have a secret suspicion it's actually to express their love for Nigel Slater. And who can blame them? We're here to celebrate the fantastic A Cook's Book, which was published earlier this year and is quite possibly the ultimate Nigel Slater compendium, containing 200 beautifully written recipes from the first jam tart he made with his mother while trying to reach the aga through to his love of Japanese pickled radishes. It is really a stunning book, the perfect Christmas present, perfect for any time of year, let's be honest. And Nigel, thank you so, so much for having me. No, an absolute pleasure. So let's start with the house <laughs> because your legions of fans who follow you on Instagram will be quite familiar with your impeccable aesthetic. <laughs> and I have to say that this house really does live up to the billing. But how do you make a decision about what to put on show and what not? And is there a rotation of objects? Well, I do love moving things around. Do you? My parents would occasionally rearrange the furniture or something. And it was a big deal. And it was done about once every two or three years. I do it all the time. So I will suddenly decide that I want a sofa in a certain place or I mean, I change bedrooms according to the season. Do you? Yes. So I've got one bedroom which is very cosy, my winter bedroom. Yeah. It's always very quiet. Mm. Um, there's another room which gets um, lovely early morning sun, and that's very much my sort of summer room. Um, but I, I also change uses. So when I first moved here, I was trying to find out where to put my desk, because as you know, as a writer, Yes. A where your desk is, is really, really important. I truly think that that desk has been in every room in this house. <laughs> it's finally settled downstairs. I like the idea of a movable feast of a mm. home. Your desk is in front of a big mirror. Is that not distracting when you're writing? I don't even notice it now. When I first moved the desk there, I thought, I'm not sure I can have a desk in front of a mirror because I'm going to continually look at myself. Actually, I don't. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's, I mean, the mirror has things stuck on it, post-it notes and postcards and things. So in a way it's almost become, uh, it's become a notice board, but I don't think of it as being uh, a mirror anymore. It's just where my desk is, simple as that. And talk to me about your writing routine, because you are someone with a ferocious work ethic. As much as you make it seem with the beauty of your recipes that it comes naturally and they're very easy to do and to follow. I know that a lot of effort goes into making something appear effortless. And I read somewhere that you always start a new book on Christmas afternoon, is that right? Mm. So that time's approaching, Nigel. I, I know, in fact, um, a, a lovely guy at a book signing the other day said, you know, you're about, you've got to sign, you know, going to start your new, your yeah. new book um, in a couple of weeks. What's it going to be about? Uh, and I, I was completely truthful and said, I don't know. Um, Christmas afternoon, it's very odd. I don't know when this habit started, several years ago, that after lunch is finished and mm -hmm. everything's packed away and the washing up's done, I sit down and start a new book. Now, I don't know why that is. It's just become, become a habit, uh, a sort of biannual sort of habit. And I mean, writing is something that I, because I spend a lot of time doing it, Various books have been written at, at different times. So for instance, Toast was mostly written at night. This is your memoir. Your this is my memoir. memoir. Yeah. Now that was written, yeah, that was written up until the, two, two o'clock in the morning, huh. I would be writing. Whereas recipe books now, cookbooks are written early in the day. I'm at my desk by 7.30. And I know that you're at your desk after having had a 60 minute breakfast, because you talk mm. about that in the cook's book. Why is that hour particularly important to you? 
because it's mine. You see, as much as I love what I do, I love writing, there's a load of other stuff that goes with it. What I call the buggerants of life. <laughs> All of the emails, the phone calls, everything. And that does interrupt, uh, interrupt my writing. So the early part of the day, I get a lot done. If I can just have an hour to myself, mm. I don't look at social media. I don't post anything on Instagram. I certainly don't go anywhere near the post or, or emails. In fact, a wonderful piece of advice, I think it was Nigella once said to me, never open the post until you're ready to deal with it. Yes. And it really is important. Otherwise you get all these open letters that you never get around to replying to. So um, that hour is, is mine. I can make myself some breakfast, drink coffee. Mm. I can read at yeah, half past six to, to half past seven. And then after that, there's writing, and then I become open to, to all the other stuff. It's so clever because then I imagine you don't feel resentful about the rest of the day being used up by other people, yeah. such as myself being right here <laughs> right now. <laughs> what did you have? I'm for... very glad you're here. I am too. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Well, this morning, ah, oh, now this morning was, was, it's very interesting. It goes in cycles. Okay. So very often it will be miso soup and it will nearly always be either yogurt or kefir and some berries, some fruit. At the weekends, a little bit of a longer breakfast. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, because it's wet and it's cold, and because I found a huge loaf of Japanese milk bread in my local baker's, so I had toast that was literally like two inches thick. Yum. And it's very soft bread. So the only way to butter it is to melt the butter in a small pan and pour it on. Otherwise you tear the bread because it's so light and, and, um, and fluffy. So this morning was a very, very thick piece of toast. With, with butter on it and nothing else? Nothing else, just butter. Because it strikes me listening to you talk now and reading a cook's book that the way you cook is probably unconsciously but helpfully meditative. You're very mindful about the way that you approach it. So that idea of melting the butter in a small pan rather than doing what I would do, it's just getting impatient and just slapping on a bit of Lurpak and then ruining the bread. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing is, is, I just want to be more like that. Have you always had that ability to treat cooking and food as a, as a moment of Zen? Mm -hmm. You see, before I was doing all this, I was, uh, I was a waiter in a restaurant, in a cafe. And I loved putting food in front of people. So I loved making something to eat and giving it to somebody. But just as much as that finished cake or biscuits or pudding or, or meal is the process. But it's very easy to follow a recipe and to hurry about this end product. Mm. But there is so much more to it. There is the joy of the process of cooking. So watching something crisp and brown in a pan, the feel of something tenderizing as you're grilling it, you know, something that was soft and is now becoming crisp or vice versa. Watching things change, onions, that you put them in the pan and they're crisp and white and hard, and then slowly they become golden and amber and very soft and sweet. And it's those processes that to me are as big a part of cooking as putting something in front of somebody and saying, here you are. Mm. And yes, I, I suppose it is Zen. That's so beautiful. And do you think it's helped you with your personal transformation <laughs> as well? To sort of see how things transform in the pan has maybe made you more accepting of how we age? I guess so, yes. It's a very, it's a very good thought, actually. Um, Watching something change, watching it hopefully go in the direction you want it to, it's all part of that, that end result that you're either pleased with or, or, or you're not. Mm. Um, and it will always be part and parcel of cooking to me, will be the little details. You know when you're rolling pastry and it starts to crack around the edges, which it always does for me, 
Um, I love that moment of pulling it, pulling the pastry in. And so it's back into a circle again and just taking my time over it, not rushing. One of the reasons that I was such an appalling chef when I was out there working in restaurants was partly because I didn't have the time to mm. put things right that were going wrong. I didn't have the time to actually enjoy cooking. And that and teamwork, the fact I can't do teamwork. So it is those little details, those moments of joy in a recipe. Um, I, more and more that becomes why I cook. And you and I have spoken in the past about when things go wrong <laughs> in life. <Yep. laughs> so Nigel is one of my most downloaded guests of all time on how to fail and it was such a beautiful interview and your failures live with me still oh i love doing that oh i love doing it i just wanted to do you forever more <laughs> there's a lot of failures <laughs> <laughs> but what happens when you fail when you're cooking i imagine it's vanishingly rare now because you are nigel slater but mm. um the impression i was getting there as you uncrack the pastry mm. is that you you like control and tidiness <laughs> So what happens when it goes wrong in the kitchen and how do you deal with it? Things go wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. And I would be, I, I wouldn't be learning anything if things didn't go wrong. They really do. And they, I mean, I've been cooking since I was, you know, eight years old, nine years old. Things still go wrong. And sometimes it is a nuisance. So for instance, if we're doing photography, and because we photograph in daylight, we have a problem when in the winter, when the evenings are drawing in, mm. I've got to get a move on mm. because we're going to lose the light, lose the natural daylight. So if something goes wrong at about three or four o'clock in the afternoon on a winter's day, I've got a problem. So I do try to get anything difficult. I mean, never start with the most, you know, the easiest recipe, start with the most difficult one, get that out of the way. I would say that Yes, most things work now, but of course there's mistakes. There's also the idea that I do too much. Mm. So I'm one of those people that put something in the oven and forgets it. Out of sight, out of mind. So I have to have my alarm on all the time on my phone, reminding me that I've got a cake in the oven or I've got a tray of biscuits about to burn. Because I need to do a lot in a short time, I've got something on each hob and I'm stirring this and chopping that. And then I'm backwards and forwards into the, the studio, into the room where we, we do the photography. Uh, I've actually got a separate kitchen for that, for that sort of work because it's daylight. Yeah. Um, but yes, of course, things go wrong. I do like to control things. I can't, I, yeah, I. We're, I, we're I, such similar personality types. And that we're, I think we acknowledge in each other, we're both introverts who've learned successfully to operate in an extroverted world. Absolutely. Does that yes. chime? <laughs> it so chimes, a huge, great bell, yeah. <laughs> and we like to be in control in order to exert some kind of illusory sense of uh, pattern to a chaotic universe. Like there's, we sort of deep down know that we're not actually in control. No, we, absolutely no. <laughs> not. And certainly if you, I mean, people do say to me, oh, your home is so serene. It all seems so calm. Mm. I mean, you come here on a day that I'm cooking for, you know, a photo session and look at the state of the kitchen and the untidiness of it, because I start out very tidy yeah. and I've cleaned down after every recipe and then I start the next one. But as the day goes on, it just becomes more and more chaotic. And if you came at the end, you'd think, what? It looks like a bomb has gone off in my kitchen, you know? Uh, and then I have to do the washing up. You have to do it right then, don't well, you? Yes, yeah. and also because I do the whole thing. We, this is something that I hadn't properly appreciated. Sorry to interrupt, but mm. before we started filming, you told me that you write your Observer food column, which you've been doing for 30 odd years. Yes, 28, 29 years, yeah. yeah. You uh, write that column, come up with a recipe, cook it and photograph it every single week anew. So the photographs we see have been taken that week and that takes three days of your week. It takes three days really to, to, to do the column. Yeah. Um, and I don't believe there are any truly original recipes anymore. They all come from somewhere, somewhere. Um, you know, you'll have an inspiration from, I don't know where, from wherever. Uh, it just happens partly because it has to 
because that's my job. Um, but by the time I have worked on a recipe, developed it, I've tested it, I've photographed it, and then I've written the story to go with it. Mm. Yes, it, it, it is about three days. And for years, I have worked um, with James Thompson, who is a collaborator. He's also my producer. But he's been away um, for 18 months now, uh, cooking for refugees in uh, the Middle East. You can't even be resentful of the fact I, that he's away. Absolutely. So I've been <laughs> truly on my own. So he set up this project called The Great Oven, where so one minute he's cooking with me in the kitchen, and I love cooking you know, with other people, and I love cooking with James. And the next minute he's feeding 200 people uh, in, in, in the Middle East. So I've been totally on my own. And when a cook's book came along and I'd signed the contract and I got to do it, suddenly COVID happened. And I thought, how am I going to get this done? I've got 200 recipes to do. Plus I've got my weekly column. Yeah. And it was a re at first, I did wonder whether the book was ever going to see light of day. Mm. As you say, control, how am I going to do this? How am I going to get everything done? And last, last couple of years, um, Toast, the memoir has been, as you know, a stage play. Mm -hmm. And Giles Cooper, who played young Nigel, so the first cooking I ever did, he was recreating that on stage. And when COVID happened, um, and I was thought, how am I going to cope on my own? I realized that all the theaters are closed. Giles would have nothing to do. Could he bear? another year of being Nigel Slater. <laughs> so I said, look, would you come and test some recipes for me? Yeah. And he said, yes, I'd love to. So I haven't been working in a total vacuum. I've been with Giles. Giles has been testing the recipes for me. So I spent a lot of time at my desk over the last year, um, running in and out of the kitchen all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's been very much, um, Working on this book has somehow brought everything together that I do. The column, the recipe development, the photography, but in a very different way. Was it rather emotional to write? Because it was coming off the back, as you say, of that stage play, which I was lucky enough to see and was incredibly moving as an audience member. So I can't even imagine how emotional it was for you night after night to see your young life played out on stage. And anyone who was Red Toast will know the themes that were being dealt with and some very traumatic early memories. So did a cook's book come along as a sort of refuge, but also a summation in a way of all of that? Absolutely. So I had watched many, many times Toast on stage and it was emotional. Mm. I knew that my next project had to be recipes, had to be cookery. And I also wanted to get back to my desk and I wanted to get back to, to, to writing recipes. I'd been on trains all over the country watching, watching the performances uh, and loving it. But I had to get back to doing, to doing, some, doing some writing. Um, this book, it's not the best of, but it was always going to be a collection of recipes that I probably make the most often. Mm. One of the questions I'm asked so many times, probably the most popular question is people say, um, which book is the hazelnut cake in, or which book is whatever. And I can't remember. I have to go through them all because it's been about 15, 17 books. I have to go through them all. And I thought, what about, as I say, not exactly the best of, but what, is, what would be the perfect book for everybody else would be the one that collects those recipes that people make the most. Now, I've got a list of recipes in my head that people talk to me about. So when people stop me in the street and say, hi, I made such and such last night, or my favorite recipe is, I kind of squirrel that away. So I know that I have personal 
favourites that I make all the time. But I also know that readers have their favourites. I thought this is the chance to get those recipes in one book mm. between one set of covers. So that was how the idea gelled. It had got to be recipes, but I couldn't go off and do hundreds of new recipes. I was working on my own. Um, the world, you know, there was no traveling. The world wasn't very nice out there. As you say, refuge. Yeah. It was this safe place. Recipes I knew, recipes other people knew, and my chance to be with them again, to look at those recipes, to reevaluate them, to tweak them, to change them. And that's what happened with the cook's book. So it was, it was a place of safety. And I have to say, if I'm allowed to, it does feel like this is the soul of Nigel Slater in book form. It's my favourite one of yours since Appetite. Oh, thank you. I love Toast as well, by the way. Yeah. I mean, I love yeah. all of your books. That's, that's just a given. <laughs> but there's something very special about, about this one. And it, and it starts with the first recipe you ever encountered. Will you tell us about that? Mm, this, was, this was making jam tarts with mum. So one of the lovely things um, about my mum is that she allowed me to cook at home. Even before I was allowed to use ingredients, I'd go into the garden and I'd take soil out of the rose bed and make chocolate cake. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> and I'd take it in. She never ate it. Um, <laughs> I'd take it in to her. Um, I've always, always cooked. But the very first thing were these little jam tarts. And I remember the whole process of making these tarts, of filling them with jam. And of course, putting too much jam in them so they all boiled over and stuck onto the tin. But I love that. And that was the very first thing I made with her. She showed me how to make pastry. Uh, and I remember she was ironing at the time. So there was the smell of the ironing and the smell of the jam tarts. To this day, that is the smell of home and the smell mm. of smell of mum. And I wanted to start somewhere and I thought, well, we'll start with that. Like all of my recipes, there is a story attached. And as a reader, you either like that or you don't. Mm -hmm. But each recipe comes with in my case, quite a lot of baggage. Um, you have to, you have to hear the whole story. It's what I do. And so the book became very personal. And because, as I say, the world wasn't very nice out there at the time of writing, I found that it was very easy to go into safe places, to go to good memories, mm. meals that I'd enjoyed, dishes that I loved doing, you know, those things that you bring out over and over again. Um, so it became an intensely personal book. So I'm not drawing a comparison between our experiences at mm. all, but I, I have a sliver of experience as to what it's like when you share your personal story yeah. for a kind of public consumption. Mm. And you wrote so beautifully and honestly in Toast about your upbringing and the death of your mother when you were nine. And then it was replayed on stage and lots of people like me will have asked you questions about those early memories. Yeah. Do you find, because this is sometimes a fear of mine, that in retelling the memories and in sort of packaging up the answers, you become more distant from the personal quality of that memory, the intimacy of it. And is a recipe a way of keeping it alive in a more intimate way? Does that make sense? It makes total okay. sense. Recipes, and certainly my recipes, they are very much linked to memory. They're linked to a specific mm -hmm. moment. And one of the joys, and there are joys about getting older, um, is that although you tend to forget things, I mean, my brain's full, so things just <laughs> drop out now, they just fall out. You can only hold so much in there. One of the joys is that you also remember things that you'd forgotten wow. about. And the other day, I, it just suddenly came to me. We were talking about broadcasters and our favourite broadcasters. And I can just suddenly remember sitting down and writing a recipe. And I think it was for a big jam tart, actually. Um, and sending it in to a radio programme, um, which was called The Jimmy Young Show. And it was an absolute phenomenon, a daily phenomenon. Um, everyone is to Jimmy, Jimmy Young. And every day he would stop his programme and he'd read a recipe. And I wrote this recipe out in fountain pen on blue paper with lines, sent it in and Jimmy Young read it out. And I just remember him saying, and this, and today's recipe is 
by Nigel Slater from Wolverhampton. And that incredible buzz of that thing. The more I write recipes down, particularly recipes from the past, the more those memories open up. Mm -hmm. Little details I'd forgotten where I was when I did that. You know, blackberry and apple pie. When I remember, yes, I went blackberry picking, but I'd forgotten that I got really, really scratched. And when I came home and there was all these sort of those bramble marks, those bramble scratches all down my hands. Little details that I end up putting in the book. Mm -hmm. They feel part of the story of the recipe, however trivial they were. And no, I don't think I become more distant. In a way, I actually become closer Good. to the memory yeah. by sharing it. Oh, it's all about connection. That's so profound. Do you <laughs> think you'll write another memoir? Because I secretly want you to. <laughs> For the sort of second half of your life. Maybe you could start that on Christmas afternoon. I am so not writing another <laughs> memoir. I've done it. Really? I've written the story. If I did anything, I mean, also remember I've written the diaries. Yes. And the kitchen diaries, although they are mostly connected with what goes on in the kitchen and what I put on the table, they're still diaries. Mm. And they are quite open and they are quite, quite transparent and very personal. Some would say too personal. If there was a follow-up to Toast, I feel that it could end up being just um, a memoir. I did this, then I did that, then I did the other. I worry there wouldn't be a real story to it, mm -hmm. and I would want that. A heavily disguised memoir as a novel might happen. Oh, now that's, <laughs> that was going to be my next question, whether you might write a novel. I'd love to. Oh, Nigel, you have to. I'd absolutely love to. I mean, you can, can't you just read the reviews now? It should stick to cookery. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows? Watch this space. Watch That's this space. Very, very exciting. Um, now, tell us why you describe yourself as a cook who writes rather than anything else, because that takes us into the kind of middle portion mm. of your life. Very important point. Um, I'm often referred to um, as a chef, and I kind of, you know, um, I'm not a chef. The word chef means chief. Mm -hmm. Well, I ain't chief of nothing. I'm not even chief of my own kitchen. Um, I've never, I, and I tried to be a chef and was useless uh, because it's teamwork and I don't do teamwork. Why don't you do teamwork, just quickly? Oh, that goes back to football at school. Okay. That goes back to when they're divvying up the classmates, who's going to be in, in which team uh, for a football match. And it was always, sir, we had Slater last week. Oh. Do we have to have him this week? You know, no, I don't do teamwork. And also working as a chef, I love cooking. I'm never happier than when I'm stirring something, you know, in, in a saucepan. But to have to work with a team, getting something out at the same time because it's going out into the restaurant, mm -hmm. no. Okay. So that's, that, that's, that's why. Yeah. Um, what do you ask me? Oh, it's just so interesting. Healthy mistrust of groups. I think we can put it under that that label. I have the same yeah. thing. I know. <laughs> My idea of utter hell would be one of those. We're going off to a country hotel and we're going to do a team building day. Hideous, hideous. I mean, it's why we're writers. Hell. <laughs> um, I'd asked you about why you became a cook who writes rather than a. Mm, that, that's right. I mean, the writing, as you know, was an, was an accident. Um, I was working in a cafe mm -hmm. and we had a, a lovely regular customer, Jenny Green, who one day told me that she had just launched a new magazine, a new food magazine, and she'd got a cookery writer, but she needed somebody to test recipes. And did I know of anybody? I well, actually, I could do that. Yeah. So I said, well, I'd love to do that. So she sent the recipes to me and I tested them. But I, I, I kind of added my own sort of little introduction saying, you know, talking about the recipe and its good points and maybe things that didn't work or whatever. I mean, generally pushing my luck, really. Um, she came back to me and said, I love these intros. Would you do some recipes for me, for the magazine? And I couldn't believe it. I, just, I never thought they'd be published. I did some recipes, a cheese and apple strudel, I think was the first recipe, and um, sent them in. And then she's right, we're going to do the photography. Can you do the food for photography as well? 
and before I knew it, I had a, 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 an article published in, in her magazine, uh, and that started all that. It was completely accidental. Um, so the whole, the whole business of being a failed chef, which I very much was, um, suddenly, no, I can do this. I can actually write about, about food. It's still everything I ever wanted. It's cooking for people. It's making something to eat. It's food related. Mm -hmm. But this was something I'd never thought to do. And there it was, and I was just loving it. And why are you so good at describing food? It's because it's a very hard thing to do. I once covered a week's worth of restaurant criticism. Oh, for did you? Yes. yes, magazine, because the regular critic was away. Yep. And it's so difficult. You think it's easy, but actually it's very, very hard to reach for the right adjective to describe something you're tasting and not to keep describing everything as buttery or kind of pillowy. <laughs> and so, pillowy and buttery. I, yeah. like, I like anything pillowy and buttery. It's I mean, so do I. It's my favourite kind of food. <laughs> but um, how, how did you know how to do that instinctively, do you think? I don't know. Um, do you I, think you've got better at it? I don't know that either, really. I mean, that's up to the readers, really, whether I've got better at it. Um, I guess it's easier now, I suppose, but I've always been able to describe things. Certainly at school, um, writing essays about, you know, what I'd done that weekend or whatever. I loved doing that. So I've always enjoyed putting putting words on a page um, and telling a story mm -hmm. about, uh, about what I've done. I've always loved that. But I suppose a lot of the descriptive side of it, it comes from being a bit greedy because I do like eating. <laughs> yes. um, you know, just give me a piece of cake. You know? <laughs> I love eating. Um, and I, I guess it just, it, it, it does just come, come from that. I find, I find it quite easy to describe food. Are you someone who, when you meet a person, so when I meet a person, I will think, this is probably the kind of book that they would like. Do you meet a person and think, this is the kind of food they might like, or the kind of food they are? The food they are. Yes. Yes. Um, I love that idea of looking <laughs> at someone thinking, what book would I give you? Yes. That's, that, that, that's lovely. Do I think about that? I don't think I do. Not really. Um, although I might do from now on. I mean, you're clearly a slice of toast. I am absolutely toast. a yeah. slice of toast. Yes, like a delicious slice of toast. <laughs> I am a slice of toast. This is absolutely true. You're a snack. In more ways than one, <laughs> Nigel. <laughs> I'm happy to be a nibble or a feast. Okay. <laughs> I don't mind what I am. Just eat me, Elizabeth. Just eat me. <laughs> I will eat you, but after this interview, okay. because we don't we don't want to shortchange the viewers of Fane Online. Um, <laughs> what do you think makes for a perfect recipe? Well, one, it has to work. Mm -hmm. And I've learned this the hard way. I've been cooking for so long now, it would be very easy to take things for granted. So to assume that somebody knows what I mean by cream or beet or whip or finely chop or roughly chop what I mean by a shallow pan or a deep pan or whatever. It would be very easy to take that for granted. And the lovely thing about having somebody test your recipes is that they ask you questions. What do you mean by this? Mm. Are you sure you meant that? And I can go away and think, well, actually, no, that isn't clear. So a recipe has to work and it has to be clear. You know, I like to think that I'm, I, I'm writing for people who often cook my recipes. So they kind of know what I mean by, but also it's good to remind yourself every now and again that this is going to be the first time that somebody has made this. There is, and I'm not saying this is right, but there is a suggestion that when men cook, they will go to a chef's book mm -hmm. and they will go to the most complicated recipe. And I'm sure it isn't right, but that is what the rule is. Um, you need to write, you need to set down very clearly a recipe that works for as many people as possible. Now, no recipe is going to work for everybody every time. There are very famous cooks whose recipes, I think, that's not going to work for me. Mm. Um, and there are other people who just, you know, it's going to absolutely work. Nigella, I mean, you know, whatever, you know it's going to work. Yeah. I do have to remind myself every now and again that this might be somebody's first attempt at a cake, for instance. Everything has to be precise and clear and detailed. But then you've got the people who've cooked for years and think, 
don't teach me to suck eggs, you know, <laughs> I can do that. Um, it's a very fine line. So you find your voice. It's a fine line between being over descriptive and also leaving people not sure of what they're doing. You mentioned Nigella there, who I know is a dear friend of yours. I adore her, absolutely. How did you meet her? So, my probably my first television series, um, they said, we'd like to introduce somebody else. We'd like you to cook with somebody. Mm -hmm. Did I know anybody who isn't already on television? I said, well, there is this writer whose work I really like, but I don't think she's on much television. Um, she's called Nigella. And the researchers went off and spoke to her and bless her, she agreed to, to have a go. We did a, a screen test and it was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. And Nigella and I worked together on the first series that I did. And it was a, an absolute, an absolute joy. And I could see straight away that this was the start of something. Why wow, you gave her her TV for break? Nigella. Well, I don't, I, no, she gave herself her TV <laughs> break, not me, she did. Um, by just being somebody that instantly you wanted to be in her kitchen with her. She, you know, I, I know it's a cliche, but you wanted to be her friend. You, you wanted to be sitting there on a stool while she was cooking for you. Mm. And I could spot that straight away. I also think that there's a quality of authenticity that the great, that the greats like you, Nigella, Otam, um, that there's there's a sense that we're getting who they actually are Can on the plate. You my tummy rumbling. I'm so sorry. I thought it was me. I <laughs> no, thought it was, it was my me. tummy. It's because I. It was cake I, coming. I promise. I haven't had um, milk toast for breakfast. Yeah. Um, oh. But do you think that that's key, that, that the, if you're on TV as a mm. cook, that you're not trying to be anything other than who you are? Oh, that's a tricky one because the problem with TV, and it's the one thing I really don't like about it, is that you end up not being quite yourself. So the thing about writing a book or writing a column is that it really is you. Mm. Whereas television, very often, there are, are so many layers that a TV programme has to go through before it appears. And sometimes you look at it and think, that isn't quite me. Um, and I, you know, you're not in your own kitchen for a start off. I mean, I mean, it's not the biggest secret in the world that most TV cooks, it's not their kitchen. Um, but also you're cooking a recipe that you're doing it because it looks great on television. It might not be something that you'd necessarily do at home. You're presenting it in a slightly different way. So you're not being absolutely true to yourself. It would mm. be very difficult to. And also because nowadays every sentence is analysed, you know, um, by a score of people, you know. Um, so it ends up being not quite you. Mm. It's a version of you. And I enjoy making programmes. I don't always enjoy watching them, but I enjoy making, ma making television. I don't watch much cookery, to be honest, on television. And I certainly don't want watch ones that um, somebody wins. <laughs> that was going to be, you don't watch MasterChef? No, I don't. Um, I love watching people cook. Yes. So it's like Bake Off, which I think is fabulous television. But when the judges start pontificating, I tend to go and, you know, pour myself a drink or make a cup of tea or something. Mm -hmm. What I love is watching people cook. And that, to me, is why I watch cookery on television. Right. Once it becomes who's going to win or who gets voted off or whatever, no, they just, they, they lose me. And is that because you have a distaste for competition more broadly? That, mm. Because we were, again, chatting earlier about how we don't read our reviews because yeah. if we read one critical one, it undoes us for days. <laughs> is that all part of the same thing? that You sort of mistrust other people reviewing there is a very well-known, very successful television programme that I watch religiously um, every sort of autumn till Christmas and because it has judges on. And then they have a public vote. Okay. And that's when it all goes to pieces. It's either Strictly or I'm a Celebrity. It's Strictly. I'm guessing it's Strictly. It's, okay. it's Strictly. <laughs> I do love Strictly. Um, although this year I'm finding it a very emotional year this mm. year. I burst into tears every five minutes. It's beautiful this year. Um, 
once the public starts to vote and it all goes haywire and you think no you're just voting for that person because they're your favorite you're not watching the dancing you know um so have you ever voted i've never voted i've been asked to do it a couple of times oh well, that was oh my gosh have you mm. and you said no i've said no i couldn't <laughs> me dancing no way i imagine you was a really good dancer absolute crap complete are, crap dancer are you just, sure is that just your internal critic? Have you got an object? I'm going to ask Giles later. I feel like you'd be a good little mover. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Absolutely not. No, not at all. When I went to kids' parties, I was always the ones that once the games had finished, yes. the musical bumps and musical yeah. chairs and all that, which I loved, once that had finished, um, I'd go home. Oh. I'd take my piece of cake yeah. in my paper serviette and I'd go home because I didn't want to do the dancing. Sure. No, not strictly, but I love watching, uh, you know, watching the programme. Uh, have you ever done karaoke? I would rather have root canal work okay. than I would do karaoke. Okay. I've been invited to karaoke. I've been invited yeah. to things that I've said, yes, I'll go to. And then someone mentions karaoke and I've suddenly got <laughs> something else to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm running out of excuses um, mm. not to do things anymore. But uh, no, no way. When you came on How to Fail, mm, one of your which favorites, I love to have to say. Thank you. I loved it too because you are just a wonder, um, and I couldn't believe it that we'd got you. And then you turned up to my flat bearing presents for me. <laughs> brought me presents today. I know because you'd brought me presents, and I my present was a failure because I bought you a lovely bath soap, but you can't was put it in your bath. A failure. <laughs> anyway, it's very on brand for me. So um, one of your failures was your failure to be a friend. Yeah. And it's one that we'd never had before and never had since. And it's a fascinating one and has generated so much response from people who could massively relate. And I would love to talk to you about that again, really. Mm, I, I, I've been told off about that. Have you? By your friends? By my friends. Who say, no, you are a wonderful friend. But I'm not. Because it's always me first. I'll help you. I'll sort out your problems. I'll look after you. I'll do what you want. As long as it doesn't actually interfere with my life. No, I'll always be a selfish friend. It's terrible. You see, I think what you've identified there is that you have good boundaries and that's not selfish. That's enabling you to be honest that when you say yes, you're fully committing to that yes. Yeah. You're not feeling like you have to. And I think that's a really generous spirit to approach friendship with. It's quite difficult to say no when somebody you love asks you to do something mm -hmm. that you don't really want to do. It is tricky. Um, I've learned to say no. I do. And I think also people have learned that I do have those boundaries so they don't bother to ask me to do something that I won't. I still get asked time to time. Um, I, I don't feel it. I, even now I don't feel as if I'm a good friend, even though people have bounced back and said, you are. Yes. I don't feel like that. Um, I feel like somebody who does actually what I want to do. Even if I do something that I don't want to do, I'll make it somehow, it'll come round to being something I wanted to do in the end. But does that come about because you had a period of your life where you said yes too much and you mm. were frenetic and unhappy? Yeah. When did that happen and how did you learn the corrective? I don't think there was a very definite moment. I think it gradually... It's like when I, when I was a kid, I wasn't allowed to leave the table until I'd cleared my plate. It was just something you did. You finished what was on your plate. It's as simple as that. It was only, I mean, even 10 years ago, that it was my trainer who actually said, you know, you don't actually have to finish everything. You can push something away and say, thank you, I've had enough. You can push it away. And I think that that has translated mm -hmm. into, I can say no. I can say, well, actually, yeah, I know it'll be a lovely party. And I know that the person next to me at dinner, I will really enjoy speaking with them. But I'm actually going to say no. I can say no. Yes. And it, I'm not saying that courage is the wrong word, but you have to have a certain confidence to be able to say, I'm sorry, but no. Yes. Because you're going to hurt people when you say no. And, and well, you're going to hurt people more if you say yes and then say no or don't say no at all, but just don't turn up. So that's why I think what you do is better. 
I don't think I've ever, I've ever not turned up. So if, if I say I'll do something, I do. In fact, I'll usually be 20 minutes early and walk round and round. <laughs> I hate being late. Yes, yeah, so do I. I've got this absolute fear of being, of being late. Control. Oh, is it? Yeah, that's what it is. Is that why I'm at the airport? <laughs> yes. Do you know what I do now? I even stay at the airport the night before. Oh, I totally understand. I check the into a hotel that. the so night calming. before. It's yeah. so calming. Oh. I haven't got that 6 a.m. cab outside. <laughs> I haven't got the, you know, the Heathrow Express or something. I can just walk out onto, onto you know, I know. Yeah. Um, a fear of being late, a fear of letting people down, yeah. of disappointing people. It can completely take over. Mm. So you do end up, yes, you say yes to things. And you're sitting there thinking, why am I here? Please God, let this finish, you know? Um, and I don't want to feel like that. Yeah. Because they can tell. How... You can tell somebody hasn't enjoyed your dinner party, I'm sure. I'm sure that's never happened to you, so I don't... I, <laughs> I don't do dinner parties. <laughs> um, how old are you now, Nigel? 103. I mean, you look about... 33. <laughs> oh, don't. You're one of those don't. You age I'm a pensioner. so well. I'm a pensioner. Are you? Yeah. But you look better than you've ever looked. I honestly think you're aging into yourself, into your looks. Oh, I'm a mess. You've always been incredibly you. handsome, but even oh, ever Elizabeth, more so. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> so, um... I'm comfortable in my own skin. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Well, good. And when did that happen? No idea. Absolutely no idea. It just... Yeah. It, it just happens. And anybody who's worried about it, and anybody mm -hmm. who thinks that it's never going to happen, it does. That's nice Just one day you suddenly think, actually, you know what? I'm quite a nice guy. I quite like myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it does, it does happen. When I do just you think, wish it had happened earlier. Well, when do you think you were least comfortable in your skin? Which decade? I was least comfortable in my skin when the thing I wanted to do most in life, which was to be a chef, I realised I couldn't do it. That was very uncomfortable, partly because I didn't know what else I was going to do. Mm. Ever since I was a little boy, I've wanted to cook for a living. And suddenly this was falling apart. I hated professional kitchens. I know things have changed, but we're talking way before me too. We're talking when um, kitchens were quite abusive places, very often, not always, but they were. Um, when there was a war between the kitchen and between the, the dining room, you know, chefs and waiters, it wasn't good. A lot of this has changed enormously. Women were treated very badly in kitchens. I've heard things said that I just could not believe were being said when I first um, joined restaurants. And I wanted to be no part of that. Mm -hmm. It made me feel very uncomfortable. I was the wrong guy in the wrong place. Then I was not in a good place. I really wasn't. And do you think the, kit, the professional kitchen climate you said there has changed? Has oh, it, definitely. Has it changed enough? It's de that I don't know because I'm not, I'm not yeah. involved in them. But friends who are in them say the atmosphere has completely changed. We're seeing a lot, I think, more respect between co-workers. Mm. And everything I'm hearing is good. That we are at last. I mean, look how many women are cooking now. Yeah. Are in charge of kitchens are getting the respect that they've actually deserved forever, but weren't getting. So this is changing and it's a thoroughly good thing. Who's the most exciting or impressive famous person that you have met through the course of being Nigel Slater? Ooh, am I putting people on the scales here? I don't do that. Have you I ever have... been asked to cook a sort of state dinner or something? No, I, I haven't. Um, I've always, I would always avoid that. Mm. Um, I'm not the right person. Also, I'd find it very stressful. And I do believe that a stressed cook produces stressed food. Yes. So it would have to be a very relaxed occasion. Um, if, if Prince Charles wants rhubarb crumble, I will very happily make it. <laughs> but if they want a state banquet, yes. not the guy. Yeah. Um, do you know, I loved working with Helena when Helena Bonham Carter was playing oh, my stepmother in yeah. Toast, the film. Toast has so many, so, so many, many faces. Iterations. I know, and, and um, next year, um, it actually becomes, uh, it, it, it has a license now to be uh, an amateur production. Oh, 
wonderful. That's and I'm hearing already there are people going to be performing Toast. Oh my goodness, there's going to be lots of mini Nigel Slaters. There's going to be lots of mini Nigel Slaters. There's already been five. Um, How amazing. I know, I'm really, really excited, excited about that. But working with Helena was extraordinary because I was allowed to go into a world that I knew nothing about. The world of theatre, the world of film, the world of acting and scripts and lines. And when I'm sitting down with Helena and she's saying, so how did your stepmother light a cigarette? Mm. Well, I'd watch my stepmother, who chain smoked, light thousands of cigarettes. I know exactly how she picked up her lighter, how she put the cigarette to her mouth, how she would put the cigarette out. And because of the way Helena works, she wants every tiny new detail. And so, do you know, my, um, she asked me what uh, perfume my stepmother wore. Well, I can remember something she got from the catalogue. Um, and I told her, and of course it's no longer made. Helena had it made up. Wow. So she wore my stepmother's perfume, which was difficult when I was on set. I was about to say. Yeah, it was really difficult when I, you know, would suddenly walk on set, spot Helena, went to hug her and thought, God, I can smell my stepmother, who I hadn't, you know, had a whiff of for 40 years. Um, it was it was most extraordinary to be invited into that world, even to be on the edge of that world. Apart from the fact that you're sitting in a car with Helen Bonham Carter, which is incredibly exciting, or you're going out to dinner with her or whatever, or to her house. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that somebody very famous is playing a part, playing somebody in your life. Mm. Incredible. Extraordinary. And actually a huge privilege. Mm to be invited into, in, into that world. It was like when, when Toast went on stage and I suddenly was in theatres that I would never have visited in my life, going up to beautiful theatres in Liverpool or wherever. And I love being invited into that world. It's very different from being at the sink, doing the washing up, <laughs> where I spend a lot of time. Do you think being in that world, seeing your life play out on stage or on screen, has helped you come to terms with what happened to you as a child? Yes. Um, because the one thing about the play was it was quite funny. So you see the funny side of everything. Um, bits, things that might have annoyed as a child or things that might have slightly traumatised. Um, you could see a funny side to them. But I don't think we do this often enough, but that thing of taking stock. When I was talking to you about your introductions to your podcast mm -hmm. and saying that there is no point that I can think of other than when you introduce a guest, that you listen to everything you've accomplished. Mm. There is no point that somebody sits down and says, do you know what? You've had a best-selling book. You've done this wonderful film. You've done the, all these things that you've done. You never really think about them because you just get on with the next thing. Watching, watching Toast and seeing that what I'd accomplished over the years and how I dealt with things that were actually a bit shit at the time, but actually I dealt with them, um, you know, in my own way, but I'd done it, was a real help. It really was. I suppose that's what you get through therapy, but I've never done therapy. Um, You've never done therapy? No. I am i don't want to put any of the wonderful work that anybody does down, but I do believe that anything like that, from my point of view, it comes from you. Mm. Yes, you can tell your story to somebody, but really and truly, what, however that therapy helps you, it's actually you. You have turned that round, maybe just by talking about it, maybe having a kind and generous ear listening to it, but it's you that have done it. So I've always thought, no, nah, I don't need the therapy, I'll do it myself. You're so enlightened and I, that's, I, I genuinely mean that. And I know that you are very influenced by Japanese culture. Mm. Just looking around this room and seeing this beautiful bowl and... Well, and I'm, I'm very OCD. <laughs> <laughs> um, and being having the honour of being served sort of green tea by you and the, the ritual that you follow. How important has Japanese culture been on your mindset, do you think? 
enormous, mm. absolutely enormous. Part of that comes from being, and as you know, I couldn't go last year um, and probably won't be able to go next year, but being immersed in a culture that is very often about respect for other people. Do you know, I was reading a wonderful book about perfume the other day, because I'm slightly obsessed about perfume. I was reading something I'd never thought of, that perfume is not a big deal in Japan. They wear it, but very, very little, because it might offend the people you're with. That's fascinating. So in most offices, you do not wear cologne or perfume of any sort because you might offend somebody. Now, to be immersed in that society, a society that respects other people so much, was an absolute revelation mm. to me. The idea that you care about somebody in the way they care about people, that you look after people. You know, when I'm in Tokyo and I open a map, I can't tell you how many people come and ask me if I need help. And don't say yes, by the way, <laughs> because that's, you'll be there for a, you know, right. half a day uh, and you'll go in the direction you don't want to. Um, but they try to help. This incredible reverence for other people's lives mm. and looking after people and taking care of them. Um, but also, and this is quite, I know this is quite trivial, but caring about the details of life. It matters that a bowl is there, mm -hmm. not there. It matters that a painting is catching the light at a certain time of day or a piece of ceramic that in the evening it takes on a different character because the light is different. So you put it in a certain place. All that stuff, which some people say anal or whatever, it means so much to me now. Yeah. And over the last decade or whatever that I've been going to Japan, I just soaked it up. Not deliberately. It's just kind of by osmosis. It's just gone into my, into my soul, if you like. You're paying attention. Paying attention to, to details. Yes. Um, and, want, and, and, and understanding there is a great pleasure of something being right. So we've spoken about your great food passions. What do you absolutely loathe to eat? Mm, not much. <laughs> eggs. Yeah. It's still eggs. But just eggs. But you don't want eggs in a cake. Eggs in a cake are great. Yes. If I can't see them yeah, or okay. I can't smell them, it's fine. Okay. If I'm having breakfast with somebody and they order eggs Benedict. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> I actually have to look away. Um, eggs are a no-no in any shape or form. I don't, I, I truly do not know. You know, in that program, um, the, the jungle one, where they eat yes, horrible I'm things. A I'm yeah. a celeb, yeah. Um, aren't Anson Tate wonderful? Oh, they're the best. <gasps> yes. Just fabulous. They are. I, I, I look at that stuff they eat and I think, yeah, okay, maybe. Yeah. Ask me to eat a poached egg. Absolutely. I'd walk off set. <laughs> Just no way. I'd do a Julie McKee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you I would not do a Julie McKee. <laughs> but um, there is, yeah, there is a line. Yes. And it's with anything that looks or smells sulfurous. Right. right. So the, the spice, aspetita, I can't stand that. Um, there is natto, which are sort of fermented soybeans. I have a problem with those. Anything that smells very eggy or sulfurous, no, not keen. Okay. Um, one of the things that I like discovering in a cook's book is that when you go and stay in hotels, you always get up and have the hotel breakfast and it's a big, and you'll have a full English without the eggs. Hotel breakfast oh, is just wonderful. They really are. Is it that somebody else is doing it for you? Is it somebody else who's making it? I don't know. I think that hotels just feel like the most enormous treat because They've always <laughs> felt like a treat. Yes. And it's a sort of signifier that you're an adult and in control of your life. If you can go and stay in a hotel on your own. There's something very grown up about toast in a toast rack. Yes. I love staying in hotels. Now, part of this comes, as you say, it's from being grown up. Yeah. It's from being, um, yeah being allowed to sort of sit at a, sit at a table. Um, some of it, I have to say, is also because I spent a lot of time the other side of the Green Bay's door. Mm -hmm. So I rather like being on the guest side. 
because although I love being a waiter, I think I've probably dreamed of being um, of being the other side. Um, I love it. Give me a hotel. I am so happy. Yeah, you know, I think when when you're going to a another country or something and you know people there you have friends there and they want you to stay with them yeah never never never, never do I that i just want to be in a hotel and that's something that i'm st it's taken me 40 plus years to realize it it's took me a, a long huge time huge <laughs> luxury <laughs> yeah as you say it feels grown up it's a luxury um also um there is something very very special about those lovely crisp linen sheets and things every day. Yes. Oh gosh, so nice. <laughs> this is a whole other interview for our love of hotels. Yeah, absolutely ad ad adore them. And and they're, they're always a treat. I, I'm i also very, I know I shouldn't say this, but I also treat people who work in hotels very well. I bet you're an amazing tipper. Um, not in Japan. Oh. Do not seems... tip in Japan. It is an absolute insult. A taxi driver will give you your change back that you have handed over. And it's an insult because they're providing a service and they think that you haven't appreciated the fact that they provided the service and they don't need it. Why is it an insult? Um, they do what they do. They do it well. They do it for you. Mm -hmm. And they do it with all their love and, and, and affection and, and respect. To actually say, here you are, here's my change. No. Okay. Don't do that. Um, it also takes out that horrible headache of tipping. It's so stressful. <laughs> it's very stressful. It's partly because it feels wrong. Yeah. It feels terrible. Here you are. Yes. You have, have, have my change. No, it's awful. It's absolutely <laughs> ghastly. But when I, was a, when I was a waiter, God, I needed that money. Yeah. I needed it so badly because I was only earning eight pounds a week. So to make 20 quid a week in tips was, you know, fabulous. But it still feels wrong to tip so i do tip but you do tip <laughs> yeah, i do tip. but then are you one of those people so now because we're so cashless yeah does it concern you for the future of the waitering industry that so many people are adding tips to their cards or and getting into very specific detail but i no, worry important. about this i really worry about this because if yep. i'm adding it to the card there's not always a reassurance that it goes to the specific waiter or waitress that i want it to go to no, it rarely does. Yes. Um, it rarely does because it has to be put. Because other, the, the problem is that you're always going to get the people in the background. You're going to get the, the kitchen porters and people who, who wouldn't get anything. So it, it, it's, it's shared equally. One of the great things, and I'm not the biggest fan of, of all social media, but one of the great things about social media is that people have been able to out those companies, those um, restaurant groups, never who are not giving the full tip mm -hmm. to the staff. They're not even giving the full service charge. And they can be outed now because you can be anonymous. And that's great. Yeah. Because when I pay that service charge, or when I add a little bit extra on, I really want to know that it's going to the staff. I don't mind that it doesn't go to the person who served me. I'm very happy that it goes to the guy um, or the woman who's washing up in, in the back. I'm very happy with that. Or it goes to a chambermaid. It's great. Mm. But I want it to go to them. And it must, it's really important that it, that it does that. And at last, I think it is. Okay. It's a really important thing to be. Um, we're winding up now. I mm. mean, I could talk to you for hours, but- I talk to you for hours. I know, it's so <laughs> lovely. And by this roaring fire, it's just delightful. Um, what do you order in? Because you're not constantly cooking for yourself, I know from a cook's book. And sometimes mm. you do treat yourself to a little delivery. So what are your favorite orders in so round the corner mm -hmm. from here i've got a fabulous chinese restaurant and it's one of those ones with the formica tables and the sauces on the yeah. on the thing yeah. and there's always a queue it's very difficult to get in it's a real sort of mom and pop type thing and they've started to do home delivery so they do these great big torn noodles the great big handmade torn yeah. bang bang noodles those yes absolutely Gyoza, even though I'm, I've got gyoza in the deep freeze, mm -hmm. I love it when they arrive. <laughs> I love it when they when 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 they arrive. Also, things that um, I guess and things I'm not very good at, like carving sashimi. Mm -hmm. I'm not good at it. It ends up looking like a lace curtain. <laughs> so I leave that to the experts. 
getting a big tray of sashimi arrive, yeah. that's fab. Mm. I have my own pickles and my own wasabi and all the things I want to dip dip the sashimi in. Those are my, my yeah, my big my my big orderings in. Yeah. Okay. Very important um, and somewhat controversial question. Mm. How do you spell hummus? H U double M U S. Excellent. That's how I spell hummus. I feel <laughs> that that's the right way to do it. And which do you prefer out of hummus and baba ganoush? Oh, baba ganoush. Oh, very good. I love an aubergine. It's my favourite vegetable. Is it? Yes. Oh. Although sometimes I think... Writes just... note. <laughs> Writes note in book. Writes note to self. <laughs> Elizabeth Day, aubergine. That wasn't a euphemism either. Um... <laughs> it never occurred to me that it was for one minute, Elizabeth. <laughs> because we are chatting just before Christmas and yeah. we are on the verge of a new year. Do you mm. do New Year's resolutions? Not really. Um... Not really. Um, do I do New Year's resolutions? I might unconsciously do them, mm -hmm. but to me, it's another. It, it's another day. I do. So I have my. I have these very. I don't go to part, New Year's Eve parties, as you might have guessed. <laughs> I don't like crowds, so I don't go to the big firework yeah. displays. So, um, but I am never going to see New Year in without a glass of something bubbly in my hand. Yes. So there is always, even if I'm on my own, there's yeah. always a glass of champagne. Um, but I watch, I watch favourite films, mm. you know, so there's always, you know, Eyes Wide Shut, always one of my... One of is my... it one of your favourite films? Yes, absolutely. I've never seen it. Oh, you must see I'm Eyes going Wide to do that Shut. when I get home it this evening. It is incredible. And the fact that the scenes between Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, a, a lot of them were filmed in one take. Yeah. Just in, a fabulous piece of piece of film. So it's always a favourite film. And that's how I will I will start the new, whoever's here. What's that's your how favorite, we do it. What's your favourite rom-com? Rom-com. Rom-com. Romantic comedies. Mine is When Harry Met Sally. I don't think I do romantic comedies, do I? Nigel, you must do <laughs> Romance. This can be your New Year's resolution. Romance. I no. think I'd do that. <laughs> <laughs> Been there. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> well, if you get a chance, I think one of your New Year's resolutions of 2022 should be to watch When Harry Met Sally. It is absolute bliss, I promise you. It's the one with the orgasm. Yes, the yes. fake orgasm scene in a cafe. You'll like it because it's that in a diner. That was faked? Yes, it was. It's People a fake it's them? <laughs> <laughs> Not with you, obviously. Just oh, in come other, on, we never get any kip. <laughs> okay, this is, this is taking them. a turn for the unexpected. Um, blushing. Nigel Slater, I've made you blush. Absolutely. You are a delight, one of my favourite people on the planet. This is a wonderful, wonderful book. Well, and I want everyone to rush out and buy it. Not that you need the help, but honestly do, because it's just such a beautiful, beautiful thing you put into the world. And you are such a force for good. And I love interviewing you. And thank you. Thank you for having me around to your home. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Probably wasn't the moment to say that, actually, but thank you. <laughs> can we have the cake now? Yeah, can okay. we have the cake now? Absolutely. No, thank you so much for today. It's been a joy having you here.